So the next um, speaker that we will have here that will bring us a presentation, um, which the title is Security of Lessons from COVID-19, uh, is Rob Slade. Uh, thank you, Rob. Rob Slade is um, an information security consultant, a researcher and instructor. Is author of the Robert Slade's Guide to Computer Viruses, Software Forensics, the Dictionary of Information Security, and is also co author of Viruses Revealed. And is a reviewer of several thousands of technical books and other uh, articles in the area, and it is recognized as an expert in the, in the field, in the computer virus and malware field. Uh, I, I could spend 30 minutes talking about Rob, presenting him, so I suggest people to go to the LinkedIn or Wikipedia page and see uh, the great back, background he has in this, in this area. So, Robert, it's your time now. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, oh, if only I can get the right uh, screen up here. And you should enable the present put the, the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> well. Uh. Thank you, uh, Corto, for uh, allowing me to to speak to you today. Uh, uh, good morning from Vancouver. I know that you guys are all waiting for dinner, but uh, it's morning here in Vancouver. Um, uh, thank you, Zena, for uh, mentioning uh, Citizen Labs as a Canadian. I appreciate it. Um, this uh, started life as, uh, well, uh, going back many, 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 many years. You can tell from my white hair. I, I have white hair not only because I do security, but because I'm extremely old. And uh, in my ill-spent youth, I uh, did um, uh, work in uh, hospitals uh, as a first aid attendant, uh, did other uh, medical stuff. So I have a medical background as well as a security background. So when the virus hit, uh, I was answering questions from colleagues and, of course, using uh, security examples um, to explain various things about the the virus situation, the pandemic, what have you. Um, eventually, I collected a bunch of this stuff and uh, threw it into this uh, presentation here. Um, unfortunately, at that point, um, I was also helping uh, somebody get their book published and uh, their publisher got interested in me turning this into a book, which I have done. So I now have like about 12 hours worth of material here. Uh, do not worry, I am not going to um, uh, present the whole 12 hours. I will try to stick to the, uh, the time limits here, um, but that's uh, sort of where this came from. Roughly structured into the, the, ten, the old 10 domains of, of uh, uh, the CISSP. Um, I, um, this is the only Portuguese I know, which I learned many, many years ago. Uh, I probably say Agua Mole con Pedro Dura Tanta Ete Fior uh, with a Congolese accent because it was a missionary from the Congo who taught it to me. And the only other time that I've been able to use it was when I gave a presentation in Brazil. Uh, and of course, the Brazilian interpreters uh, at that point uh, translated it into uh, Brazilian Portuguese for me. Uh, I used it then because I was talking about the history of malware. And um, of course, that particular proverb relates to, uh, to malware and the, the fact that um, uh, constant repetition of attacks uh, can eventually uh, create a problem for you which again is now relevant to the um, uh, to the coronavirus uh, situation and and uh, so a, a little interesting side issue there and just to prove that i was in brazil uh this is a capi um, capybara that was uh, in a ditch near the the uh, uh, venue where i was doing the presentation uh, so, uh, for everybody else, um, the pandemic was declared on March the 11th. That's the uh, first time the World Health Organization was willing to use that term. Uh, and the infamous basketball game and sports as we knew it came to a grinding halt. 
um, or a screeching halt, really. Um, but for me, it was the, the morning of, uh, well, the, March the 10th. Uh, in the morning there, here in Vancouver, um, March is a very important month for security. We have CanSec West, uh, biggest conference, security conference in Vancouver. Uh, B-Sides Vancouver comes right after that. Um, we had our Vancouver Security SIG meeting. I had two speaking engagements, uh, you know, at, at coffee time in, in, on that morning. And by dinner time, gone, everything gone, so nothing. Uh, so, you know, things can change for you very quickly here. Oh, one, one other thing. I am from uh, Canada and British Columbia. And one of the things I suppose to say in this presentation is that I know that I'm speaking from something of a position of privilege. Uh, I know you can't see all the, the little details down here, but this, um, even though I took it a while ago, was at the time a chart of the infection rates of any jurisdiction over 5 million population. And um, that little tiny blue dot down at the bottom, that's British Columbia. Even though we had a fairly early outbreak um, and, and we have had uh, outbreaks in uh, uh, senior citizens' homes, care homes, that sort of thing, um, which has been very disturbing, I'm sure for, for everybody. Um, the uh, powers that be here in, in British Columbia, we've been singularly fortunate. Um, some of the, the luck that we had was purely random. For example, the uh, spring break uh, this year, and, and the dates of that were set years ago, I'm quite sure, uh, but just happened to fall at the right time so that um, people, uh, like parents, were you know ready to keep their kids home from school but had not yet actually left for uh, uh, travel. And, and so uh, a lot of the travel related outbreaks and that sort of thing, we, we managed to keep under control. So anyways, uh, interesting points. Uh, okay, before we get into the domains, of course, the, the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And oh, by the way, I noticed that uh, somebody is recording this. So, um, you know, you're being recorded here in terms of confidentiality. But uh, also, in terms of confidentiality, contact tracing, um, very important factor in, in managing everything here, but it's a really amazing issue in terms of confidentiality because our security, our physical and medical security here, is at odds with uh, issues of privacy. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into that a, a little bit later on. Um, in terms of integrity, there are huge amounts of misinformation and disinformation, deliberate disinformation. Um, now, some of this stuff is just in error. Uh, early on, the, the COVID dashboard that uh, Johns Hopkins University put up, um, Canada disappeared from the dashboard, um, which uh, you know probably nobody else noticed for, for those of us who lived there was a little bit uh, uh, disconcerting. And uh, there are also issues, uh, you watch the news about the, the virus and the pandemic. This is, you know, it's weird. You, you will uh, have endless reports and, and of course, uh, you know, uh, a certain president of a certain large country which um, has the worst record in the world right now, uh, has said that most people will experience only mild symptoms and get over it very quickly. That is actually true. But then you have all kinds of reports of people saying it's the worst entrance illness I've ever had. That is also true. And unfortunately, the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, we get these reports in the, in the media and how do you determine you know, what to believe in there. And you need to trust the, the statistics, the mathematics involved in it. Um, you can't you know, really get a good handle on it just uh, looking at, at news reports. Oh, by the way, for those of you who are, um, uh, have your thumbnails on, on uh, the right side of the screen may have a, a bit of difficulty seeing this, but uh, this was a really interesting thing going back to the, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic. Um, and, and this was a device that actually uh, supposedly produced ozone and you, you would breathe in ozone and it would clear the germs out of your uh, uh, throat and nasal passages and, and breathing passages and that sort of thing. I doubt that it produced much ozone. Um, 
and so it probably wasn't very effective. And it's probably a good thing that it didn't produce uh, much ozone because ozone is in fact poisonous in, in large volumes. So uh, just an interesting thing that I came across. Now, of course, there is, there's misinformation um, and disinformation. They come from, from different sources. I mean, there's a lot of ignorance. You know, th this virus has been around for less than a year, actually you know, some indications that yes, it has been around long, longer. Um, some historical research that people have done uh, may be detecting uh, certainly something similar uh, a long time back. But in terms of an actual disease in humans, um, it's a very short time. And, and we're still learning all kinds of things about it. We, we don't know. Because we don't know, there's a lot of fear and, and fear uh, tends to push misinformation. Um, when we are afraid, um, we aren't very good. We, we get stressed. We do not make good decisions. So, you know, keep that in mind in security overall, as well as with regard to the virus. There's also um, contention in terms of the experts. You know, some experts will say, uh, you know, masks are important. Some experts will say masks are not particularly important. Um, and so who do you, who do you trust um, out of the, the contention of even expert ideas? And then again, there are those who are just trying to create outright fraud. Uh, there are always fraudulent sites. Um, uh, people supposedly setting up fake charities. Um, uh, you, well, I'm sure that all of you have, have seen uh, spam, phishing spam, various frauds coming into your email, uh, playing on issues about the, the uh, virus and the pandemic. And I've, I've noted uh, a huge surge in things like um, attacks on, on my Netflix account. You know, people saying that, that my next Netflix account is going to run out unless I go to this website and, and give them my credit card number. Um, which doesn't particularly work with me because I don't have a, a Netflix account, but that's okay. But lots of attacks on, on things like email. So, you know, people who are at home who may be in lockdown situations um, are going to be fearful of losing those points of contact. And, and so they're going to be susceptible to those frauds. And then there are just a right of tax. There are the nation state attacks. And of course, recently, the attacks out of Russia, particularly, but also from, from other places, um, directly attacking institutions that are involved in, in vaccine research, for example. So all kinds of, of security issues there. And availability. Toilet paper? Really? I mean, honest to goodness, you know, I, I, I bow to no one in, in my admiration for this stuff, but really, um, I have no idea why the, there was this huge, huge run on toilet paper. Now, getting into the domains, uh, security management, starting off with security theater, and, and you've seen these kinds of images on the uh, news media and, and people um, uh, misting or fogging in, in large open areas trying to deal with the virus. I have no idea what is in that, that device um, because there is nothing you can spray into open areas that would deal with the virus, that would you know, kill the virus and wouldn't kill you, uh, basically. You know, any, anything that you spray or fog around in, in large open areas in this kind of way um, is if it was going to be effective against the virus, it would be very, very bad for human health. So all of this stuff really is security theater. People, uh, governments particularly, need to be seen to be doing something even if it's not effective. And, and you know, we see security theater in, in many, many areas. Uh, social engineering, um, though, uh, I mean, security theater is a part of social engineering. and and. We tend to think of social engineering in terms of attacks. Um, you know, the bad guys are using social engineering against us. Uh, yes, that's, that's important, but we need to use it ourselves as we can. Um, and uh, there was this uh, meme, if they had just called it the stay at home challenge and posted it on Facebook, the virus would have been gone by now, you know? So there's a, a sort of a social engineering way to do it. 
uh, risk management in, in security management here. Um, in, in terms of the masks, um, I, I don't want to say don't wear a mask. I mean, you know, it is, there are many uh, situations where wearing a mask is a good idea, but uh, the, the pushing of the masks is, is really interesting because there really isn't any evidence that masks are a particularly effective, you know, there's much, much more effective ways, you know, washing your hands and social distancing, all of these things are much more effective than, than masks are. So masks has become a hugely divisive issue. Uh, and, and maybe it's sort of security, th uh, self theater, uh, if you will, but we'll, we'll come back to masks if I have time. Um, so risk factors here. Uh, I am old. I am male. I am fat. I have diabetes. I have high blood, blood pressure. All of those are, are, you know, high risk factors for getting. So if any random SARS-CoV-2 virus comes along, I'm, I'm toast. But, uh, you know, th there are different risk factors here. Um, emergency management is for emergencies. Um, a lot of people, I, I've seen a lot of reports, uh, again, in the news media and, and uh, you know, people complaining, saying, you know, oh, uh, you know, the government isn't doing enough for this. They, you know, uh, we were saved from a cruise ship, but, the, you know, the government didn't put us up in a four hearts star hotel when they quarantine does it you know all these kinds of things emergency management is for emergencies this is an emergency this is a disaster um you know have a a bit of patience maybe for for some of these minor issues um anyways uh, gain in security management uh cost benefit analysis what um what is it going to cost to help us to fix this thing? And, you know, isolation is the way to kill the virus. But, of course, it also kills the economy, too. And, and economic uh, problems do, in fact, have major medical consequences. And, and so we want to uh, have a balance. And we need to do that cost-benefit analysis as we need to do in any area of security management. So... Uh, yeah, uh, and again, I, one of the things that I, I keep on seeing in the media is, uh, and particularly when you see a press conference and, and uh, reporters are always, always, always asking uh, this variation on the same question about different events or whatever, how vicious are you gonna get with people who break distancing rules? And the thing is, again, going back to social engineering, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Um, and uh, I will be talking about uh, uh, Bonnie Henry, our, our provincial health officer here in BC. Um, she has been absolutely wonderful about um, repeating the fact that we are talking about education when dealing with the virus and, and insecurity. Education works an awful lot better than mandating. You have to f follow our policies. You have to follow our rules. So, um, you know, keep those types of things in mind. So uh, moving on to access control, layers um, of access control and, and the, the different types of, of tests there. The, the tests that are, uh, you know, where they stick a swab in your nose, um, that's looking for RNA of the virus. And, and I'll come back to that in, uh, when we get into application security. But um, then there are the serology tests. Um, which are looking for the antibodies that your body produces. And, and it's interesting, the different types of information that these different types of tests will provide you and the, and the different questions that they're going to answer. So uh, different layers in uh, our things. And, and uh, issues of error rates. We always have error rates in, in all of our security controls, uh, you know, false negatives. And we, we tend to think, uh, you know, here, uh, false negative, not being able to identify a virus is, is the worst case scenario. Um, but we also have false positives and actually false positives in a pandemic situation here with uh, relatively low levels of, of incidence, which is what we're faced with, um, is actually a lot worse because um, I don't, I don't know of actually any of the tests that are out there, uh, RNA or serology, that have um, 
uh, less than a false positive, 1% false positive rate. And as a matter of fact, 1% um, false positive rate would be very, very good. Most of them are, are like, you know, 10 and 20% uh, false positives. And you're faced with 1% incidence, uh, which is actually higher than any place except the United States right now. Um, then you've got a 50-50 chance of being right in terms of being told, you know, uh, no, you are, uh, uh, you are infected with this virus. And so if a lot of people are being falsely told that you are infected with the virus, then a lot of people are being quarantined, uh, not allowed to go to work, whatever. And, and that has more damage overall than issues of the, the false negatives and, and people going out into into the world and infecting other people. So uh, interesting uh, rates there. Security architecture. Um, inter I don't know who started the phrase, bend the curve, not the rules. Um, I first heard it from our, our health minister here in BC, but I'm sure that uh, he was repeating it from somebody else. Really interesting point. Um, a lot of people looking at that issue of bending the curve um, said that well, what's the point in bending the curve because the same number of people are eventually going to get it. You're just spreading it out. But uh, when, you know, this is time-based security, an excellent example of time-based security. And I, I highly recommend Wynne Schwartow's book on time-based security, which uh, addresses uh, something along those lines. Boy, I'm definitely not going to get through all these slides. What the heck? Uh, functional versus assurance requirements. Interesting here. Um, uh, fast food uh, restaurants always have um, hygiene issues, and and they're talking about uh, uh, people uh, dealing with uh, food, and and they've got to wash their hands and that sort of thing. But um, there's two. Uh, types of, of requirements in security. There's functional, that's the hygiene requirement, and there's assurance. That's do we know that our functional control is actually working? And uh, looking at gloves um, versus hand washing. Hand washing is effective in terms of uh, the actual hygiene functional requirement, but we don't have the assurance requirement. We can't tell if somebody's worn you know, wash their hands. But if they wear gloves, we can actually see that. So we also have the assurance requirement there. Very interesting uh, issue there. Uh, oh, and defense in depth and layered defense, having layers of, of defense. You know, we know that any any given I issue is not going to do it. Uh, the, the travel checks, for example, um, uh, the temperature checks, the temperature checks aren't, aren't very good. They, um, you know, really, they've they've got less than a, an eighty percent success rate, and so you know, people are going to get through that. We need to have some other kind of of check to to backstop them, um, and of course, in any situation, just you know, can't say, don't ever say, it can't get any worse because unfortunately, uh, here in Canada and Nova Scotia, faced with the pandemic. Um, in April, they then had the worst mass shooting in Canadian history. Then they had a forest fire. Then they had a, a helicopter crash. Then they had a, a pilot die from our, our national uh, flight team. Um, yes, it can almost get worse. So, um, think simple ideas. This this was a really this is an idea that's so simple it's it sounds silly. Um, this guy who, who made um, equipment for restaurants, um, he realized that most people in restaurants were wearing ball caps, baseball caps, build caps. And so he came up with this idea for a face shield, which everybody else was making, you know, really fancy versions of face shields. He made this really simple idea of a face shield that clips onto a baseball cap. So everybody that he's selling to in the restaurant industry now can get this cheap version of a face shield. And, you know, a, a face shield is, is in some situations is, as good as a, a face mask or possibly even better. So, you know, if it works, you know, it's a silly idea. It looks silly, but if it works, it's not silly. So 
Think of the simple ideas. Oh, business continuity planning. Um, the best thing, it's always hard to get uh, companies to, to go into business continuity planning. Um, the best way to get uh, management to buy into a business continuity plan is to have the building across the street burned down. Well, there's a lot of buildings across a lot of streets burning down. So during the pandemic, use it as a reason for business continuity planning. And there's, there's so many issues here, capital risk, financial margin, market changes, succession planning, supply chains, you know, so, so many issues, unfortunately, in, in business continuity planning. Oh, and, and leadership. Um, leadership is vitally important in business continuity planning. And fortunately, right now, we have an excellent, excellent, comprehensive example of how not to lead during a disaster. And all you have to do is, is look at that example and whatever he's doing, don't do it. So uh, that's uh, one of the other issues in, in business continuity planning is um, the difference between recovery and restoration. And of course, the, the pandemic demonstrated you can stop fast and, and recover the most important issues first. But when you're doing the restoration, you restart slow, restore the most important issues last. Um, you know, make sure that you are planning, that you are testing, that you are being careful as you restart in terms of your, your business continuity restoration. Ah, and you know, if you want some extra toilet paper here. Um, so, uh, yeah, do we need a break in terms of all of this disaster going on? If you're a new single-stranded RNA virus looking to survive in this big bad universe, not, rule number one is surely not to pick a fight with the only double-strand DNA-based organism that can sequence your genome and has eradicated more species than any other living thing. That's us. You know, uh, We probably are going to get through this. Oh, and the, the German government is advising people to stock up on sausage and cheese. It may be a worst case scenario. So physical security, um, keep your distance. And this is, a, you'll notice that, I, well, maybe you'll notice it's a tiny little sign there, but it says talking about maintaining social distance, but it's on an asphalt spreader. And I was, you know, I mean, I know that uh, it's a, a mandated WorkSafe BC uh, sticker that they, you know, it, they're, talking about keeping people apart from each other, but how, you know, why do I need to be told to be two meters away from an asphalt spreader? Um, this mask won't protect you from COVID-19, but it'll sure help with the social distancing. So, uh, yeah, anyways. Uh, during the virus crisis, if you go out, note that you might get coughed on or sneezed on, and since disinfecting fabric is much more difficult than cleaning surfaces, you should wear older clothing that can be discarded if necessary. If you have old, torn clothing that will not be missed, this is probably best. Uh, since face masks are in short supply, a scarf worn over the mouth, nose, and lower part of the face will offer some protection. If you are infected and must go out for some reason to aid you in walking, uh, you should take a staff, should be, be overcome with respiratory distress and need something to lean on. Best to have bells hanging from the top to summon aid if necessary. As you go, it's best to give some vo verbal warning to others not to come into close contact since some you may encounter may not be proficient in English. It is probably a good idea to constantly call out something simple such as unclean, unclean. Anyways. Uh, cars and insurance, uh, people have been worried about the fact that uh, insurance companies aren't giving back car insurance since nobody's driving. I've seen you guys driving during the uh, pandemic. I know why the insurance companies are not giving back any money. Uh, crypto, Phil Zimmerman, if he's still around, uh, would probably agree with my first thought when I, I thought about structuring this and I was saying, oh, cryptography, you know, that's one area that we're not going to have to worry about, or you know, there's no, no lessons that come out of COVID-19. I was wrong. Um, the contact tracing apps and, and the, the protocols, uh, very interesting work in, in terms of that. And, and those, 
standards there. Um, if you are interested in cryptography, that's that's something to to look at and study. Um, uh, application security, as as we talked about testing before, different types of tests give us different information. Um, and uh, uh, the toilet paper thing, um, one of the uh, uh, paper mills that makes toilet paper here in BC actually had a malware infection. So if you have stockpiled toilet paper, you should safely dispose of it because it may have been infected with a virus. Now, this is, I, I'm probably going to run out of time here. So the one, the one issue, um, I came to security from malware research. That's where I started out. And one of the things that I learned from malware research is the Bastion model is wrong. The, uh, the Bastion model looks at it and says, you know, we're the good guys. We're on the inside. The, the attackers are all the bad guys. They're on the outside. If I in my Bastion, you know, and you're in your best and if a bad guy is attacking you, it, it's not a problem for me. Because, you know, it may even be good for me because as long as he's attacking you, he can't be attacking me. But when you, you study malware, you realize, no, the, the Bastion model is, is wrong. It's not helpful. We are all in this together. As has been said um, in some areas, um, we, may not all be in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. And helping others um, helps you. And uh, I suppose, um, given I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get through uh, all of these slides, probably I, I should stop there, uh, unless you want me to continue on into the Q&A session. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for your presentation. You touched in some good points here. Um, when I was assisting your presentation, came to my mind several, several um, thoughts about how we, we live our lives, how we correlate the things between our social and daily lives and our professional lives and our interests in this field of cybersecurity. And um, particularly touched in topics like information and misinformation or uh, disinformation, uh, like fake news. And of course, all of this is now used to influence people and uh, is also, also deserves a study here to, 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 to avoid or at least alert people when they are uh, looking to fake news or real news, but this is a big problem. Um, like the presentation we had before, I have the same idea here. I think we should have um, education uh, since the, 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 the initial uh, times in the school uh, to get more conscious uh, about this, these problems and to gain also some uh, cyber ethical behaviors because otherwise it will be a mess, I think. Um, uh, and I also, when, I, when you are presenting, I was also thinking that um, all of us find, uh, tenderly, normally find more opportunities or alternatives during the emergency periods or emergency times. And this could be also used uh, by the economists <laughs> to uh, slow down or uh, accelerate the, 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 the countries, the development in the countries. And this is a big and huge topic here because typically, People try to find, to figure out solutions to, to the problems they, they, they face. Um, I don't have any questions here. You touch in a very good point, and I think everyone is, is thinking on, on, on the point. So, um, Raul, thank you for your presentation, for bringing us this, these perspectives and open, allows how, how us, us to open our minds and also see the problems in different perspectives. Thank you, Rob. I, I did think about the um, uh, the Red Queen situation from from an earlier talk there, and and I thought that the uh, COVID situation is is an excellent example of that. You know, events uh, can overtake you if you're not flexible enough to 
uh, note the, the changing environment. And, and you know, uh, COVID-19 has certainly changed all of our environments very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And also created opportunities for the malicious actors. And, yes. uh, and then you touched it in that point in terms of social engineering. And, uh, we are working hard to prepare people in terms of awareness for this type of, of, of activities, uh, social engineering. But it's, it takes a long journey to, to, to get some results. And it's a continuous work. And it's interesting for that. And this uh, pandemic accelerates the needs. And it, at, at least it helps to develop more this conscious and allow us to work harder to get results. Um,